Um, I'm very pleased. We've got a, we've got a series of papers now, and I'm very pleased to invite. Um, sorry, I'm very I'm very pleased to invite Sarah because she's been here pretty much on and off throughout the entire day. So it's going to be lovely to hear what she's talking about. Um, so Sarah, you are. I saw you here a second ago. Um, I I am here. Um, yeah, I, I really. I realise I'm now backlit, so I look like I'm in a witness protection program, but um, it is it is me. Um, uh, and I will just get my presentation up. Yeah, excellent. So um, Sarah Campbell's from the University of Exeter, and she's going to be talking to us about process over product, valuing open-ended creative practice and interdisciplinary collaboration. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, what I want to do is really start by showing you a short two minute film that um, shows better than I could tell uh, the process of our creative fellowships. So I'm with the University of Exeter, which is in the southwest of England, and I've been in post for about two and a half years. And I come from a background of museum and gallery education. And uh, so I'm just going to start by showing you the film and then I'm going to dissect the Creative Fellowship Program. So, touch wood. Hi, I'm Judy Brown, I'm a poet, and I'm enjoying very much working with Peter and his team um, on their uncertainty quantification. My group works on this thing called uncertainty quantification. So, Increasingly, these days, we have big numerical models that live inside computers that do things like predict the climate or how the human heart works. And if you're going to use those predictions from these big computer models to make decisions, you need to know how good they are. You can't rely on a prediction that doesn't have an uncertainty estimate. What we do is we develop mathematical methods to estimate those uncertainties. What I'm starting from, I guess, is a point of uncertainty. I have no maths background whatsoever. So I came into this almost thinking, I, I know that I'm going to write some poems, but I almost don't even know how. Peter's team have talked to me, I've read books, but at the moment I'm playing around with notes and work, putting down words and collecting everything in basically a process notebook. So although the notebooks have m multiplied somewhat in the weeks I've been here. And we've had so lots of nice conversations at about mathematics and poetry and uncertainty and how you communicate uncertainty. I'm, I'm very interested in how you communicate uncertainty to decision makers, uh, particularly how you do that with words. I've been surprised how interesting I found it. And, and sometimes I want to think, you know, I, can, I just want to come into your world for 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes, 10 seconds. You know, I can hold my breath for that long. I know I'll, there's only a little bit that I can find out, but I really want to get a flavour of it. I think the thing that surprised me the most was how quickly she's picked up some very difficult ideas and concepts and comes back and asks me questions that if a second year PhD student had asked me, I'd have been quite impressed. I mean, it probably never happens to people that they're allowed to dabble a bit in learning a little bit of maths solely for pleasure, but gosh, it's a strange and interesting experience. So what you've seen there is a summary of one of our creative fellowships from a couple of years ago. Peter is a mathematician and he specializes in uncertainty quantification. And so we have fellowships where we bring creative practitioners from different disciplines into research contexts. And we want it to be an open-ended conversation. So we do an open recruitment process and we interviewed a range of people with lots of different disciplines. Um, what made Judy a good fit for this project that we found really interesting is she came from a background in law. And so there is a real structure and the thinking that comes with the law training. And this image on the right shows her really beautiful notebooks that uh, Peter's team were absolutely fascinated by. So the purposes of these are to encourage mutually beneficial exchange. And I think that's really a key part of what we're wanting to encourage. And uh, more often than not, uh, the projects that artists have had with us have inspired them to go on and get further funding and develop those ideas further. And the researchers want to keep their artists, which I think is a, a sign that something's working. 
Now, I inherited this program. So I moved to Exeter for my role and was to deliver the strategy. And there were a couple of programs already in place. But I recognized the potential of this from my prior experience where I'd been at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London for the six years previous working in the learning department. And uh, there were a couple of projects I worked on there that really, I suppose, set up my thinking to be able to engage with the creative fellowships as we have been. So in 2016, I did a Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Traveling Fellowship, and that allowed me to go to the US for a month. And I was interested in people who were innovating in museum practice. So there are quite deep wagon ruts of workshops, talks, conferences, lunchtime lectures. They're done all over the world in museum learning, but there were a few really interesting folk who were trying very hard to break out of that, that structure, do something different. And I was interested in what made those programs interesting and particularly who were the people behind those programs and what was it about their mindset and their working context that enabled them to innovate. So uh, through a series of interviews, I came up with the structure on the right and um, did a lot of reading around the creative process and not surprisingly, these things chime with what I was observing. Very keen empathy, huge amount of curiosity, low ego, really keen to kind of put a whole bunch of ideas on the table and the best idea wins. Uh, but it's really important. I think the characteristics of the organization were also key that it doesn't matter how brilliant you are, it will fall on barren soil if you're not working in a context that will support you. So off the back of that experience, uh, I worked on an impact framework for learning for the for the VNA's learning department. And we were really guided by this document on the right, the OECD's Future of Education and Skills. And you can see, I mean, those are a few examples on the left of the other reports that I was looking at and sort of cross-referencing them and seeing what we could kind of boil it down to. And there has been a huge amount of work over the last few years about design processes and design thinking, about uh, skill sets that are needed in the workforce, and then the suitability of um, education and how all these things can join up. So I saw creativity all through this report. So looking at this, this quote from the OECD, students will need to develop curiosity, imagination, resilience, and self-regulation, respect and appreciate ideas, perspectives, and values of others, cope with failure, failure and rejection and move forward in the face of adversity. So all of that to me is like just a sort of creativity summary. And it ended up boiling down to this. Uh, so head, heart and hand in a nutshell. And I won't go into detail, but we sort of broke down and had an understanding of all the different skill sets that were developed um, in thinking about the world of work, the world of education and the role that design plays in this. So to come back to the creative fellowships, uh, when I inherited this opportunity, there were things that I was really keen that we protect and promote. So open-ended creative practice, it was really interesting to break artists of the habit with residencies of putting in proposals that were already predetermined what the artist was gonna make. There's such an expectation around funding and opportunities that the artist comes in knowing the answer. And we really wanted to avoid that. And so that sort of took quite a lot of explaining, I suppose, and what we were looking for. And we're really excited about the opportunity to think something new, to really kind of go into this with no fixed agenda about what was going to come out the other end. Um, because makers are makers, irrespective of art form, uh, not surprisingly, every fellowship has something at the end of it. We think of it as a sort of a sketch or a maquette. Some people have something quite thoroughly worked up. Other people, it's just early thinking. But we're interested in telling the ideas, in telling the story of the process, not the product. We're interested in thinking about how did that poet and that mathematician get on? Where were the sticking points? Where were the kind of uh, moments of surprise? And this phrase, great ideas come from playing with possibilities, is really key to how we think about what we do. We create possibilities by opening up opportunities for different disciplines to come together. From the academic side of the fence, uh, what we had to kind of 
nudge them away from is the expectation that they are the ones holding the bucket of knowledge and they pour that into the empty bucket of the creative practitioner, that this is a, a broadcast mode. Um, because academics are often called on to do that. And we were super keen that no, both of you will benefit from this. You will get a different world view. And I think um, Peter and his team's fascinations with Judy's notebooks are a good example of this. And this image on the right uh, demonstrates what happens when you have uh, a stand-up comedian and uh, a lecturer who's a co-director of the sexual knowledge unit come together and devise a new format. So you get this new thing that sits somewhere in the middle. And uh, what we also get in feedback a lot is people don't just get an insight into somebody else's discipline, they get an insight into their own. And uh, Ina has spoken a few times about seeing comedy in her research and it never would have occurred to her before. So she has a deep knowledge of her subject, but she's now looking at it refreshed from working with someone outside her own subject area. Um, it's not always perfect. And I think this is where the serendipity comes in. Every time we really try hard to match the practitioner and the host together in a way that will lead to a successful interaction. But human chemistry is mysterious. Uh, we, uh, sometimes people really gel, sometimes it just doesn't quite fit. Uh, and I've really discovered language has a massive impact within academia about how it's used, what it means, expectations, and we don't always drill into these shorthands enough in advance. Expectations can be quite deeply entrenched, and if we're encouraging a new way of working, if we don't communicate that fully, that can cause some problems. And from the perspective of us as a sort of commissioning body holding this, it's very difficult to scale up because they're such intimate, close projects, and we work closely with the artist and the host to, we hope, make them fly. And um, so you can't do that on scale, or at least we haven't found a way to, and I'd be interested to know anyone's got ideas on that. So when it doesn't work, that's also fine because we're still learning something, and we really encourage that too. Um, I'm going to hurry up. I realise the clock's ticking. Um, so really interesting feedback from artists sort of surprising themselves about what they learned and how it opens up new ways of working uh, but I think this comment from the host at the bottom about the challenge will be to find ways to fund these and have them recognized as legitimate components of research practice and pathways to impact is a valid concern um, I think I hear a lot that practitioners who are interested in more experimental spaces don't always get it recognized within the sort of framework and structures of the academy. So these are some of the key questions that we think about in arts and culture with our programming. Uh, what are the conditions that enable and limit creativity? Uh, how do we determine those boundaries? And I think it's interesting that Alan mentioned boundaries towards the end of his talk about you either have to create them for yourself or if you're operating within quite within a framework that encourages openness, that doesn't mean an entirely blank piece of paper. Where do you put those edges? And it will be different for everyone. Uh, building community through Zoom, all three fellowships this year we've done entirely remotely. I haven't met any of them in person yet. Thinking about legacy, what follows, and how can we share this? The benefits are so embodied, and it's once you've done it, you get it. So how can we possibly get word out about different ways of understanding this? Um, so those are my slides. And I wanted to just leave space for either any questions or potentially um, any reflections that you might have yourselves from your experiences of holding space with artists, or what it is to be held in a commissioning process and what that means. Um, so I'll just stop sharing. I haven't noticed. Um, so are there any questions from the floor, any observations? Wendy, are you talking to us? 
I wondered what. Um, so, are there any questions from the floor? I'm so sorry. Um, I, I mean, I have a million questions, but um, but I'll I'll leave somebody else. May feel free to put it in the chat, or to um, otherwise unmute um, if you if you have a particular question, or if any you've done anything similar in your own institution that you that you've um, found valuable. And um, maybe I, what I what I wanted to ask you because I think it's come up quite a few times um, is and you you touched on it twice in your talk you, at the start you said that the artists you wanted them to be allowed to explore um, without having to necessarily know what the end product was and then you came back to it again when you said that one of the issues was with funding these things so I mean how do we develop a funding model which allows not knowing what the answer is going to be. Um, and do you think that's sort of possible in the funding landscape that we have at the moment? I've seen a, an expansion and contraction in that space. Uh, I would say the recession of 2008 has had an effect, but I, I had noticed in major funders that they were moving from a, this is a three year project, what are you gonna do at the end of it? Um, which isn't very interesting, like why do the project? to really encouraging a relationship with the funder and say, okay, set out your intentions, but if you actually do what you said you were gonna do, then you haven't learned anything. So really encouraging a culture of working with the funders to develop your ideas and to sort of shift your focus as you go. Um, with COVID and money being tight, and I think anyone with money needs to justify what they're doing with that money, that can lead to shying away from more open-ended working. And I think perhaps moving into safer territory. So it'll be interesting to see when there's so much com competition for such limited funds, if how much funders can kind of hold their nerve or hold space for that experimentation. I think there could be a risk of perhaps falling back into a tried and tested, but that's sort of instinct rather than gospel. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. In a sense, it's some things that are like are, are a luxury, and this sort of thing seems like it's a luxury. So we'll invest in things that, that are less so. Um, but I think what you've shown us is it's not really a luxury in that way. Um, Katya has a question, um, which is what motivates hosts to enter into such a collaboration? So how do you select, I suppose, as well, and make those those yeah. alignments? We um, we do a call out across the university and ask people to get in touch if they would like to work with a, a practitioner. And we're quite careful with that process because some folk will get in touch saying, we've just finished a two year grant. We didn't have any money for communications. We'd love to have an artist to do, you know, artwork about what we've done um, because all the thinking's complete. And that's not uncommon, you know, um, and that's really not what we're looking to do. Uh, what we're keen on is, so for example, Peter always provides a great example he feels very strong about communicating visually his research around uncertainty quantification and he says he works a lot with politicians and funders and he he's a very strong communicator but he's interested in alternative modes of communication and feels he's strong on the visual but he would love to have more of the the sort of the, the verbal or text-based modes of communication so he was motivated from a place of, I can learn something here and I can think about what I do and I can add some tools to my toolbox. And anyone who sort of is speaking in that way from a host perspective, we're like, yeah, that's bang on. That's exactly the space that we're keen on. And sometimes we do push people outside their comfort zones. Sometimes people come to us um, with the artists that, we, that they want to work with and it's too close to their own subject, you know, so I think getting a, a you need that distance. So for example, we've worked um, with a specialist in uh, film and Victorian entertainment, such as Magic Lanterns. And we paired him with a choreographer um, because we needed, a filmmaker just would have been too close because it would have been um, too cozy and you need a distance to be bridged in order to sort of stretch your brain out of what you're comfortable with. Um, so the feedback that we get is that the hosts just find it inspiring, I think, when their lives are so much about getting funding, you know, getting funding in and working against expectations. This is a play space for them. 
that's fantastic. And um, and and that thing you were talking reflect. There's a paper by Jacqueline Lane about um, beneficial collaborations, and and there's a sort of inverted an inverted U sense of how useful collaborations are. And if you're too closely aligned, then you don't have that useful tension. If you're too, if you're too separate, you can't communicate, you don't speak the same language, so you get nowhere. So really there's this sort of sweet spot in the middle where you have enough in common, um, but also um, but also you have enough difference to be useful to each other. Um, Sarah, that was really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's, it's such a delight actually, having gone through all the abstracts 18 months ago and spent all this time to actually get a chance to really hear people talk about it after I've been sort of waiting, um, it feels like forever. So thank you ever so much for um, your talk now. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um,